Good morning, my name is Jay Salbright and I'm a community group leader here at Church in the Valley. And I'm on the board of directors and I'm also in the Antioch training program to prepare me to go into full-time ministry. So this summer, we're gonna be looking back at some classic stories from the Bible and finding themes that we can take away from those. And today, we're gonna to look at the story of Joshua and Jericho. So once you think about a time where you faced a seemingly impossible task, something you never thought you'd be able to finish. For me, this happened last summer. So to celebrate a friend's milestone birthday, we decided to go and hike Half Dome because this is something he always wanted to do. And hiking Half Dome itself is an accomplishment, especially when you're scared of heights like I am and a couple of the other guys were. But this trek seemed to be more than I bargained for. We decided to backpack out, spend some time out in the, in the woods, and then hike Half Dome. So we packed on our packs and we started up a really big hill, probably a bigger hill than I was prepared for. And I had a little too much weight more than I should have had on my back there in the hot July sun. And we trekked up this hill and it was pretty tough. And I was thinking, oh man, this is only day one. So we get to the pond, we set up camp and the day is good. Well, the next day we're gonna hike Half Dome. And so I put on our gear, we gear up early in the morning and we start the trek. Now, most people, they tend to start at a lower elevation and hike up it and then hike back down. So the backpack, the back part is all downhill. For us, we decided to do things a little differently. So we started at a higher elevation, kind of had to hike down to the base, up Half Dome, back down, and then back uphill the whole rest of the way. So that's already hard enough, but then you add in the hot July sun, I was a little dehydrated, and I thought I was never gonna make it. We were trekking up this hill, and it seemed like at one point, I could only walk about 10 yards before I would cramp and just have pain. And I didn't think I was gonna make it back to camp. And so I was praying and asking God, please help me, because I knew I couldn't sleep here by the side of the road on the trail there. And I really loved my wife, wanted to get home to my wife and kids. So I had no choice but to press on and keep going. And I'd hit that wall again. And I thought I'd never make it back up those last five miles that were all uphill back to our camp. It just did seem like a really impossible task. But with a little bit of prayer and some encouragement from my friends, we pressed on. And over time, we finally made it back to camp. And I never thought I was gonna make it. I thought I would still be sleeping by that trail today, but we made it back. And as hard as this was for me, I can't imagine how hard it was for Joshua when he had to face the city of Jericho. So there was a point in time where the Israelite people were slaves in Egypt. And when the time came, God chose Moses to lead his people, the Israelites, out of slavery, out of Egypt, and into the land he had promised to give them, this beautiful land flowing with milk and honey. And so they, he called them out of this land, and he had Moses lead them, but the people disobeyed, and because of that, they had to wander in the desert for 40 years. So our story picks up when Moses passed the baton of leadership over to Joshua in Deuteronomy 34. And at this time, Israel was at the end of their 40 years of wilderness wanderings. Joshua had been Moses' faithful servant for most of those 40 years. And at this point, he's approaching 90 years of age when Moses calls him to be Israel's next leader. Joshua's task was to lead the people into the land of Canaan, drive out those inhabitants, and then divide up the land amongst the 12 tribes. So this wasn't a divide and conquer. This is a conquer and divide type of strategy. The Lord commissioned Joshua, commanding him to be strong and courageous. So we read in Joshua 1, 5 through 9, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So three times we see that God commanded Joshua to be strong and courageous. He promised to be with Joshua as long as he was careful to obey the law, which we might call God's word or the scriptures now. And as Joshua does that, as he obeys, God tells him that he'll be with him and that he'll have success. 
The key is that he can be strong and courageous, not because of his strength or his abilities, but because God is with him. God gave Israel the land of, by conquest to fulfill the covenant he had made with Abraham, as well as to pass judgment on the inhabitants of that land. The promised land was occupied by the Canaanites, and these were not good people. The Canaanite people practiced idol worship. I went on Wikipedia, which I know is not the best source, but I counted over 51 gods that these people worshipped. They practiced human and child sacrifice. They were sexual deviants practicing religious prostitution. They were known to use occult and magic practices, including divination and consulting the dead. And on top of that, these guys were not pushovers. They were really fierce warriors and a very heavily fortified city. So as we saw, God established Joshua as the leader of, the new, of his people. But these Israelites, they weren't pushovers either. They had over 40,000 trained, battle-ready warriors ready to go in and take this land by force that God had promised to give them. They were ready to go in, but their first test came when God asked them to let him provide the victory at this large, heavily fortified city of Jericho. Jericho itself was called the City of Palm Trees, and it had a huge grove of palm trees nearby that produced a healing balm that Jericho was famous for. Some historians believe that this grove was as big as three miles wide by eight miles long. It was just massive. Jericho itself is considered the world's oldest city, dating back to approximately 10,000 BC, and it's considered the world's first communal walled city. It was a center for both trade and travel, and while many people were living in caves, Jericho was actually an organized city. The Canaanite people were technologically advanced for their time. Canaan was one of the first civilizations with an alphabet. They are one of the earliest peoples to use pottery, flint arrowheads, have domesticated animals, and have agriculture. Jericho itself is the lowest city on earth, and it has a very low geography, so it has a lush underground spring that still flows today. Water continually flows into that area to replenish that spring. And so while many other ancient cities and civilizations had to move because of drought or changing river patterns or loss of underground resources, Jericho flourished. And in fact, there's still people living in that area today. So world's oldest city still has people there today. And this may be one reason why God promised this land to his people and why it's referred to as a land flowing with milk and honey, because it flourishes. Jericho was a key city. It guarded the pass into the highlands of western Canaan. And being set on a hill, it probably would have appeared even more imposing. Um, it was the most important city in the Jordan Valley, and it was the strongest fortress in the land of Canaan. It was the key to all of western Palestine. So now, we see that Israel had over 40,000 soldiers, and so you'd expect that they'd be confident in their strength and in their might, and they're ready to go. But God asked them to trust in His power, not in their strength. And this was a big ask. They were going to have to trust Him, even though it likely made no sense to them at the time. Jericho itself was known for its impenetrable walls. Archaeological findings tell us that these walls were somewhere between 11 and 16 feet high, and over six feet wide at the base. There was a large wall, uh, stone tower inside the wall that was over 28 feet high, 30 feet wide at the base, and had an internal, internal staircase. It's believed that these walls had never been breached before. If you think about the fact that these guys were technologically advanced and they had the big wall, you can see why they were such a force to be reckoned with. The Battle of Joshua and Jericho was around the Bronze Age, so there's no guided missiles, no dynamite, no C4, no trebuchets or large weapons of war. So how were these guys going to take down this massive, impenetrable wall? You would think that God would give them some new invention to blow it up, but instead he asked them to take it down in a pretty unusual way. We read in Joshua 6, 1 through 5, now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went in and no one came out. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. 
You can imagine how hard this was to wrap your mind around if you're one of those 40,000 soldiers. They might think, you're telling me that God wants us warriors to walk around this wall and while they're mocking us and throwing things at us and it's just gonna come down? How is this even gonna work? So even though it didn't make sense to them, they chose to obey and God kept his promise to them. Archeology span reveals to us that the walls came down violently and suddenly, like in an earthquake. There's bird marks inside the city that show that it was then seized. And they have found stores of food showing that, showing that the city wasn't sieged, that they encamped around it and waited till the people basically came out on their own. So it was taken violently and suddenly and by force, just like the story shows. This campaign into central Canaan drove a strategic wedge between the north and the south so that they couldn't ally against the, against the Israelites. So this is a key victory into taking back the promised land. So there should be no way that walking, shouting, and blowing trumpets would bring down these mighty walls. But in God's realm, the impossible became possible and the people gained the victory as they trusted God and they did it His way. Trusting Him, submitting to His commands, and seeing that blessing and success and victory came only after they chose to obey him. So as amazing as this story is, there's some key, things, key themes we can take away. The first is we can trust in the Lord even when it doesn't make sense to us. We can submit to God even in the face of trouble. And we see that success and blessing comes only after we obey, not before. So first we trust in the Lord even when it doesn't make sense to us. So I tend to be a very practical and pragmatic guy. When I'm faced with a big problem or decision, I dive into research, looking at all the options and trying to see what the best choice would be. And then I go and talk to people who've been there and know more or are wiser than me. And through that, I can make a reasoned decision to mitigate risk and increase my chance of success. And overall, this has really worked out a lot in life and I've gotten, I've accomplished quite a bit already and I've had very little downside because of taking this strategy. And this has worked for me until I had my son. And if you know my son, he has some difficulties. And one of his biggest is that he has a, he has a real difficult problem communicating. And we've seen many doctors and therapists and specialists and tried a lot of treatment strategies and all with very little success. So I would sometimes get very frustrated and I would ask God, how is this good for him? Why aren't you helping my son? I've asked you for help and you're not helping him. But in my frustration and in those moments, the Holy Spirit would remind me of a passage that I memorized years before I had my son. In Isaiah 55, eight and nine, the Lord says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So here the Lord is reminding his people that we're not gonna understand his ways or his thoughts. When I get frustrated, it just doesn't seem to make sense to me, but that God reminds me that I, I have a very limited understanding and I don't have his perspective on, on life and how things really work. What it comes down to is what Paul said in the, to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we live by faith, not by sight. Joshua and the Israelites had to choose faith, to choose to trust God rather than in the might of their army when it came to breaching these walls and conquering Jericho's army. All I can do is pray for my son and trust God that he will do what is right for my son and what is best for him, even when it doesn't make sense to me. He loves my son way more than I do, and I can trust that he will do what is best for him. So after we trust in the Lord, even when it doesn't make sense to us, we can submit to God, even in the face of trouble. God's ways don't always make sense to us, and that's where trusting him comes in. Once we trust him with the outcome, our next step is to submit to him. When God was commissioning Joshua as the new leader, he instructed him in verse seven, only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to the, all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. Submission is about obeying God's word exactly. To bring down those massive walls, God gave them exact instructions. They were not to obey them halfway or half-heartedly. Not one time for five days, no trumpets on day two, not seven times on day three. There was exact instructions that they were to follow. And as they did, they were to see God's success. 
Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. and all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. We often want to take the most direct path towards our goal, but sometimes the shortcuts in life end up costing us more than if we'd stayed on the path from the start. To Joshua, in his understanding, he could have been tempted when faced with these fierce warriors behind their huge wall to trust in his strength and the strength of his 40,000 warriors. But instead, he trusted in the Lord and relied on him to make the path to victory straight. So I'm a physical therapist, and oftentimes if you come to me with knee pain, I'm going to end up working on your hip or your ankle to help you get better. And so when someone comes to me, I have to t- ex- take the time and explain to them why doing these extra steps actually helps them more in the long run than if I just worked on their painful knee. I don't know about you, but when I face pain or trouble, I just want it to be over as quickly as possible. I want to get past the pain and get back to my normal, pain-free, trouble-free life as quick as I can. The main reason people come to me is because they're hurting and they want help. So when I start addressing an issue that doesn't seem related to their complaint, they often wonder why. So I have to start and ask them to submit to my instruction, to trust me with their pain and their trouble. I ask them to not lean on their understanding of their problem, but to submit to my understanding, to lean on my understanding because I have, a bigger, I have the bigger picture and better understanding than they do. If they entrust their care to me, they're gonna have a better outcome in the long run. In 2 Corinthians 1, Paul tells us about hardships and pressure that he could barely endure but that God used those so that he would not rely on himself, but trust in God. Trouble is a normal part of life, and it can create the pressure we need to rely on something. We all, find, we all want to find success when there's trouble, whether there's trouble at work, at school, in some relationship you're having, maybe an illness. Trouble's just a part of life, and life is really hard. When I face trouble, I want to know that it's all going to be okay. I want to know that when I'm that when I make it through to the other side, that it's all gonna have been worth it. But success and blessing comes after we obey, not before. In our main passage, we see in Joshua 1.8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, then you'll have good success. God tells Joshua that he needs to spend a lot of time in his word, the scriptures, meditating on them day and night. Only after he obeys God's instructions will he find success in this mission God has called him to. Hebrews 11.6 tells us that trusting in the Lord involves believing that God exists and that he rewards those who seek him. It's saying, I trust in the Lord when I live his way and wait for him to come through and do what he has promised to do. It means that I remain faithful to God's direction even when things look impossible. In Luke 5, at the start of Jesus' ministry, before Peter knew who Jesus really was, he was just another fisherman. He'd been out all night fishing and hadn't caught anything at all. Jesus called out to him after he had spoken to a crowd of people, and he said to Peter, who was then called Simon, to go out to deeper water and put out his nets for a catch. In Luke 5, 5, we hear, Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. He could have assumed that this guy didn't know anything. I mean, this guy's a teacher and a carpenter. He's not a fisherman. What does this guy know about catching fish? I've been out all night. I know what I'm doing, and I didn't catch anything. He could have said that. But we see that in verse 5 that he said, all right, well, I'll choose to obey, and I'll go out and do this. So first he obeyed. Then we see in verse 6 and 7, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Peter realized that this was no ordinary man. He recognized him as the Lord, and he recognized that he was just a sinful man in need of forgiveness. Often it seems that God's kingdom is upside down. I don't know about you, but I want to know that I'm going to get the blessing up front before I obey. So like after a long day of work, when I come home, maybe you're the same way, but I'm really tired and all I want to do is eat dinner and relax. But I know at the same time, my wife Tracy has been home with the kids all day and she's been working around the home and she's probably tired, could probably use my help. And I know my kids are going to want to see me and do something fun with me. Before I was married, I learned a phrase from one of my mentors, Nathan Lewis, that has really helped me in those moments. So before I ever get out of the car, when I'm sitting there in the driveway, 
I say to myself, the most important part of my day is about to begin. And if I do this, then I know that when I, if I choose the right perspective and I can go in, that God's going to give me the strength and energy I need to help my family and my, my kids out as I choose to put their needs, their goals and interest above mine. If I go in and just do what I want, yeah, I'll probably get the rest and refreshment I want, but at what cost? What's that going to do to my family? But if I trust God and I choose to put their goals and interests above my own and ask him for help, he's been faithful to give me the energy I need. And I have to trust him, though, that he's going to give me the rest and refreshment later that I need. We see Jesus model humility and selflessness, enduring the pain and suffering and humiliation of the trial and death on the cross for us, to pay the price for our rebellion and our sin. In the garden before he was arrested, he was overwhelmed at the thought of going through the pain and suffering of the cross. He said in Matthew 26, My father, if it is possible, let this cup be taken away from me. But I want your will, not mine. He entrusted himself to the Father and his plans rather than what he wanted in the moment. Through that selflessness came such great blessing. Had he chosen to do what he wanted in the moment and not endure death on the cross, he wouldn't have, we wouldn't have forgiveness for our sins. Had he not submitted to the Father's plans, trusting him, then he wouldn't have paid the price for our rebellion and we wouldn't have a way to be reconciled to God. So thank God he chose to trust and to submit to his plans so that we could be forgiven. So when I go in to put my family's goals above mine, I know that God will be good to me and he'll take care of me and give me what I need and he'll use me to help bless my family in that difficult time. We're all gonna face trouble in life. We all face trouble and life is hard. We're instructed to trust in the Lord even when it doesn't make sense to us. We're to submit to God even in the face of trouble and when we're unsure of how it's gonna work out. And we're to trust God, that success and blessing will come after we choose to obey him and do things his way, not our way. And after we choose to obey, then we'll see these good things. <clears throat> the temptation when faced with a massive wall that seems insurmountable is to trust in yourself, your strength, your understanding. But instead, we're asked to trust in God, rely on him to get us through the hard things. God didn't take Joshua and the Israelites around Jericho. He took them right through it. He took them right through the hard thing. But he said, if you trust me, I will go with you as you go through this. Be strong and courageous, for I will be with you wherever you go. As you submit to God, you trust in him, obey what he says, you too are going to experience God walking through the, the trouble with you to the other side, to the side of success and blessing. So there's some next steps that you can consider taking this next week to apply what we talked about today. First, I'm going to trust in the Lord with blank. So is there some area that God has shown you that you need to trust him with this morning? Next, you can say, I'm going to submit to the Lord in some area of my life. This week, you can choose to submit to the Lord and do the hard thing that he's asking you to do, even if you don't fully understand why his way is better than what makes sense to you. If you haven't already made Jesus the Lord or boss of your life, a great next step would be to submit your life to him. Psalm 34, 8 tells us to taste and see that the Lord is good. If you aren't sure what that looks like, you can note that on your connection card online or on the card if you're in person with us, and we'd love to help answer your question and help you understand what that looks like. Finally, you can say, I'm going to ask someone more mature or further along in their faith and walking with God to help me learn how to trust and to submit to God in whatever area you're facing. So thank you for joining us today, and let's, let's pray together. God, thank you so much for helping us see that you are good. And like Joshua, we're going to face hard times. We're going to face walls that seem like we can't cross them. But you've asked us to trust you, to submit to your ways, and that as we do, that we'll find success and blessing on the other side. So thank you, God, that when we face hard times in life, and we all will, that you promise that you'll walk through the hard time, through the trouble with us. You're not going to always take us around the trouble. We're going to still face trouble, but you'll go through it with us. So thank you, God, that I'm not alone when I face hard times and trouble. And thank you, God, that you promise to be with me when I face these hard times. And I know you will with all of us. So we thank you for this. And we ask that you walk through this next week with us as we trust you. In your son's name we pray. Amen.